Would the members take their seats, please? Uh, before I call the roll, this is the last meeting of, uh, I guess, this uh, interim as well as this term of the legislature. Uh, we have some members that uh, have, are not running again, and I just wanted to recognize those members. Of course, Senator uh, Matt Caslin is not uh, not running again. Um, Representative Birch, uh, Tom Birch has been here ever since I came here. Uh, I think he's the dean of the house. He's probably the longest serving member in the history of the General Assembly. And uh, certainly uh, Representative Birch has always represented his constituents very well. So we commend him for that and uh, we uh, honor his uh, service to the General Assembly and the committee as all the other members that I'm going to mention. Uh, Representative uh, Cantrell, Mackenzie Cantrell is also not running again. Uh, Representative Jim DePlessy. Uh, Representative Norma Kirk McCormick is uh, not, not uh, running. Um, Representative Mary Lou Marzian. Representative Melinda Gibbons Prunty. And I think Representative Attica Scott. So I want to thank all of you for your service, and uh, we certainly will miss uh, having you uh, on this committee. So with that, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Senator Carpenter, Senator Caslin, <laughs> Senator Harper Angel, Senator Schickel, Senator Southworth, Senator Turner, Senator Webb, Senator Westerfield, Senator Wheeler, Here. Representative Blanton, Representative Bowling, Representative Bridges, Here. Representative Birch, Here. Representative Cantrell, Representative Dossett, Representative Dotson, Representative Duplessy, Representative Flannery, Here. Representative Fugate, Here. Representative Johnson, Here. Representative Kirk McCormick, Here. Representative Marzian, Representative Miles, Representative Gibbons Prunty, Representative Scott, Representative Stevenson, Representative Wesley, Here. Representative White, Co-Chair Smith, Present. and Co-Chair Gooch. Present. Okay, we don't have a quorum, so we won't. Uh, we'll dispense with the reading of the minutes. Um, Senator S uh, Smith, or my co-chairman, is here today. Do you have anything you want to uh, say or mention, Senator? No. Okay. All right. With that, we uh, we we really have kind of a short agenda today. Um, we're going to have a discussion on issues related to the Public Service Commission, specifically an explanation of. Uh, Legislation, I, I'm not sure there is any legislation yet, but there have been some uh, talk about uh, securitization of uh, utility regulator, regulatory assets and then energy price volatility and its impact on the utility customer's cost. And uh, with that, I will introduce uh, uh, with from the Public Service Commission, uh, Kent Chandler who is the chairman, and Kent, we welcome you here today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Gooch. I appreciate it. So um, I just want, first want to apologize. I, I certainly didn't provide this uh, this presentation with much much advance. Um, I, uh, I You all asked me last week, and I've, I've thrown something together. I don't want to indicate that throwing something together is any disrespect to the committee, but uh, on short notice, these are uh, at least the initial part of the presentation, so some pretty complicated uh, uh, subject matter. So um, this is, I think, maybe the fourth time I've presented to either the uh, IJC or either the House or the Senate um, uh, committees. And so I'm going to, uh, again, give our just our quick background, because most of you all have heard it a handful of times this year, uh, and then get to the meat of the situation. So uh, initially, I just want to say, um, again, my name is Kent Chandler. I'm chairman of the Kentucky Public Service Commission been a commissioner for about two and a half years. Prior to that, I worked at the commission. I was a consumer advocate uh, in the attorney general's office practicing in front of the commission. Um, importantly, I can only speak for myself. Uh, nothing I say today is should be taken on behalf of the Public Service Commission. The commission can only speak through its administrative orders. Uh, and I certainly, uh, what I say today doesn't reflect upon the other public service commissioner. Um, so uh, the Public Service Commission is an independent regulatory agency that's connected to the Energy and Environment Cabinet for administrative purposes only. Uh, it's a three-seat commission. 
that carries out the legislative function of rate making uh, through quasi-judicial um, <laughs> quasi-judicial proceedings. So if that's not a, a mouthful, I don't know what is. So we technically have uh, more than a thousand utilities that we regulate. The majority of those are utilities in name only. Uh, they are uh, entities that we don't actively regulate, such as um, uh, certain certain telecommunications providers. We actively regulate the way I would, uh, that's my description, it's not a technical term, about 200 utilities. Those utilities provide water, sewer, gas, uh, electric, and telephonic services. Uh, we've got uh, investor-owned and cooperative, uh, member-owned cooperative electric utilities. We regulate uh, rural water districts, rural water associations, investor-owned water utilities, um, and uh, natural gas distribution systems. Two things to point out to everybody I think the, that are important for these conversations is we, we don't regulate muni municipal utilities at all. Uh, if it's a city-owned utility or a city-affiliated city utility, we don't regulate them, except that we do regulate the safety of their natural gas distribution systems if they have them. Uh, we also do not regulate the rates or service of electric cooperatives that receive their power from the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, the, they, they, that's something about the supremacy clause. They look down on us trying to tell them what to do. So the Public Service Commission was created by the General Assembly in uh, the 1930s. Um, everything we do, uh, for the most part, at least with regards to utilities, relates to rates and service. The statute says that rates have to be fair, just, and reasonable, and that the utility has to provide service that is adequate, efficient, and reasonable. So um, in talking about this idea of, of what's called securitization, um, I felt it was probably, it's probably impossible to understand in a 30-minute presentation. It's taken me probably about two and a half years to have an appreciation for the complications. But it is uh, certainly impossible if you don't have an appreciation for how the commission regulates utilities rates. So quickly, I'll just do some background uh, and talk about the, the parts of rate making that are relevant to this idea of what's called securitization. Um, hopefully, I can give an example of, uh, of how it w can work in other states that have this. Um, and then I'll stop and pause uh, for questions, but I'll certainly take any questions throughout um, the, the proceedings. So utilities in Kentucky are not competitive businesses. Instead, uh, the General Assembly says that their rates and service need to be regulated by a state entity, the Public Service Commission. So the reason for that, or at least the uh, initial concern for that, was around the, uh, around the risk of uh, wasteful duplication of the same types of investment and service. So you all have probably seen pictures of the cities in the early 1900s where you had telephone and electric poles that had 100 different wires of all these different competitors running across it, right? The concern was that that was not a particularly efficient use of capital. So specifically for electric utilities, the General Assembly uh, has provided all electric utilities defined service territories. So municipalities, electric co-ops, investor-owned utilities have defined service territories down to the foot. If they are the only entities allowed to provide electric service to anybody that's an electric consumer in that territory, and there is no competition. With that, though, they have an obligation to serve every single entity that W demand service in that service territory. So whether it's a home, whether it's a factory, whatever it is, if you are located smack dab in the middle of that service territory, that utility, as long as you follow their commission approved rules, they have to provide you electric service at defined rates. But a, a great, a state granted monopoly, which is exactly what the defined service territories are, creates two primary problems. The first is that once uh, an entity gets a monopoly, that they're going to provide really terrible service to people. The second is that the monopoly, as we all know about monopolies, would like to have profits that are well in excess of the cost that they incur. So the solution to those issues is to regulate the utilities' rates and service. So again, and I'm going to say this two or three times, but rate regulation of monopolies, especially investor-owned monopolies, is a function of costs. So in the ideal, I'm going to take a big step back and talk about economics for about 10 seconds. So in an ideal version of, of competition, and in particular, a quote, perfect market, short run prices will reflect or should reflect the marginal cost of a particular product. The introduction of monopolies leads to an exception that the firm will charge prices or an expectation, sorry, 
Uh, monopolies, the concern is that they're going to charge prices in excess of their costs, leading to a sale of less goods, since things are more expensive than they ought to be, and resulting in what's called deadweight loss. So this goes back to, this is primarily economics from the early 1900, a concern around, um, well, I'll just say the, this thing called the marginal revolution, it's kind of been disproved since, but this idea of when supply meets demand, there's a perfect price, right? So under a scenario of having monopoly prices, the producer makes more, has more surplus than they would have originally under a competitive system. The consumer has less surplus than they would have under a competitive uh, scenario. But there's also this amount of, quote, surplus that accrues to neither the producer or the consumer, right? So although the producer is better off, everyone, all of the world would have been better off had there been competition, right? And what doesn't get realized is called deadweight loss. And so just here's just a, a little map. Uh, where can, peace can I yeah. interrupt? I think Senator oh. Wheeler may have a question oh, of, no, I was later. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's right. he's getting in early. Yes, he yeah, is. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> he's at, he's outside of the theme park waiting waiting for the gates to open. So, uh, just quickly, in, in a competitive market uh, is where uh, PC. Uh, the competitive price uh, meets QC, the competitive quantity, right? The amount of quantity that would be purchased uh, in a competitive market. So M, QM, and PM are, are the result of a monopoly. So the price is higher and the quantity that was sold is less. The yellow there is dead weight loss. We are all worse off if a monopoly is able to charge prices in excess of the, uh, of the perfect uh, price or the competitive price. So this is this is mostly theory, but it it, it is the primary concern with uh, non-regulated monopolies. So with that, again, going back to costs, since we have concerns about the prices that a monopoly would charge, particularly charging rates in excess of their own costs, rates are are created by public utility commissions based on the cost incurred or the expected cost to be incurred by a utility. So when we have rate cases that are filed with us, the very first thing you do in rate making is to determine all of the cost of a utility that they've either incurred, if you're looking backwards, or expect them to incur in a particular year that you think, and I'm saying the fictional public utility commissioner should think, that a utility should incur, right? So if the utility paid every, all of their executives an extra million dollar bonus, that's a cost they incurred. But a regulator may not think that that's a cost that the utility should be able to recover from customers. So all of these different costs are taken into account. And these costs can include operations and maintenance expenses, uh, investments that the utility has made, and also includes a return on the capital that those investments uh, are, underpinned, or are underpinned by. So here's a, a, just how we create what's called the revenue requirement. The revenue requirement is the determination of the utility's annual expenses that the Public Utilities Commission says should be recovered from customers. And it's calculated as follows. You take all the operations and maintenance ex expenses, which some of uh, kind of makes sense as repairs, depreciation expense on assets, labor costs, salaries, fuel, insurance, taxes, uh, there you said taxes, uh, taxes always feel like twice, so I'll just say it twice. Um, you take all those operations and maintenance expenses, and then you add it to this other number. And the other number is a return on your investment, a return on your net investment. And that's calculated as being your original investment, reduced by the amount of that investment you've already recovered, times a rate of return. So the rate of return, and this is where we're getting down to brass tacks when it comes to securitization. The rate of return that is used to calculate a utility's rates is the cost of debt and the cost of equity capital that underpins their investment. Now, this is the part of this that I'll stop and make very clear that when I'm talking about all of this, this is the calculation and the beginning step for regulating investor-owned utilities. This is not the calculation used to determine the revenue requirement or to make rates for member-owned electric cooperatives. And the reason for that is they're not investor-owned. So the return on investments is not the primary reason or not uh, a primary calculation for setting their rates. Their rates are set differently. And their rates are just about being able to repay their lenders and having a little bit of cushion left over in case things don't go right. That's the simplest way I can describe how you set rates for electric co-ops. So here's an example of what that rate of return, and that's 
the rate of return and the level of investment is all that securitization deals with with utilities. So the rate of return in that in that uh, calculation is the cost and the type of capital that was used to fund the utilities investment. Now we all have an experience that debt capital, borrowing money as, as debt, is less expensive than equity capital because of the rights and the risks that come with each type of capital. Lenders in bankruptcy always get the first uh, swipe at whatever's left over, right? Um, after that, equity investors get whatever is the remainder at the very end of the day. So equity investors have a higher risk of a return on their investment than debt and uh, debt holders and lenders do. So if a utilities investments were funded by both debt and equity, and this is, this is fairly uh, representative, it's about half for most utilities. Half their uh, investments are funded by debt and the other half is funded by equity. So if you're able to borrow money at 4% and you're able to get money from investors at about a 10% cost of equity, your cost of capital on an average basis is 7%. Half your cost is at 4% and half is at, at 10%. If you had originally invested in your utility $100, and you've already over the last few years recovered half of that, $50, when you're calculating your rates as a utility in this year, that 7% is uh, calculated based off your current net investment, which is the remaining $50. And so your return is $3.50. Now, $3.50 in this, uh, in this uh, you know, scenario is not the utility's profit. $3.50 is the rate of return. Part of that rate of return is the amount that you have to pay back each year to your lenders. That's a dollar. So that is the half of the $50, the remaining uh, split, that $50 is split 25-25 debt and equity. And of that $25, your debt rate was 4%, which is a dollar. So $2.50 that year is the utility's return on equity. Right? That's the amount of profit that the utility made for shareholders in this uh, given scenario. So <clears throat> it should be clear by now, if I did any, <laughs> did my job at all to this point in the presentation, utilities make more profit the more they invest, right? That is, that's what the whole scheme is set up to do, right? The idea was that legislatures decided that electricity and water and gas is good. We want our people to have it. And how do we get private capital to go out and put steel in the ground and pipes in the ground to provide those services to people? They, the legislatures decided to incent investment in those services, right? So the more steel in the ground, the more investment a utility makes, and you apply the exact same amount of return, the more money that utility makes, right? So- Kent, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Along those lines, um, does the Public Service Commission limit what a particular utility may invest and if you do is that because you're concerned that that if they're investing more the rate is passed on to the consumer so the, the answer to the first question is the the in, in rate making the public service commission explicitly sets the amount of investment that should be recovered so the answer is yes um, now uh, just a nuance to that answer the PSC tells you how much you can recover from customers, not how much you can invest. So if you decide to go off uh, hog wild, I guess I'd say, and spend a, invest a bunch of money that you that the, maybe the commission had previously told you not to invest, the utility runs the risk of not recovering that from customers. Uh, but the answer, I guess, the, the direct answer to your question is, is yes. The commission, in figuring out what the rates ought to be, sets the amount of investment that should be recovered from customers. So that, and then the answer to, the second answer why it's really fact specific to the reason why there's probably dozens of reasons in a particular situation why the utility might uh why the commission might not might try to limit or inhibit the amount that customers recover or that the utility invests and i would say that my experience has been that one of those reasons is a concern for the impact on rates if the utility invests too much money because again if it's recoverable from customers it's going to show up in that bill so in your experience you think generally uh, utilities um, will probably not invest more money than what they're allowed to recover on. I, I would, I'll, I'll, I'll say this differently. I would say that in any situation where you're rate regulated like this, that um, you would most likely invest money that you believe to be recoverable. 
Um, and and so that goes back to one of our, our primary statutes. It's the uh, it's originally the second uh, section in, in Chapter 278, the section we operate under it. And it basically says before a utility can build something, it has to come to the Public Service Commission to get a certificate that that uh, expansion or that building is necessary, right? Um, and that was a way of getting basically pre-approval. I'm oversimplifying it, and that's not technically legally correct. But it, it basically getting pre-approval before the utility goes out and spends a bunch of uh, money and invests a bunch of money, they would come to the commission and make sure that that investment is needed. And that does two things. One, it makes sure that the utility uh, is that the commission is making sure that the utility is making the right kind of investments, but it also protects the utility to a certain degree because they've already had the commission pass judgment on their proposal that that investment was needed. So that really reduces the risk that in the long term, the commission won't deny recovery of those investments. Okay. So, but now in some cases you're talking about if that utility is trying to expand, but another situation may be that that utility is wanting to upgrade like existing infrastructure, mm-hmm. whether it be pipelines or, you know, utility, the grid or whatever, uh, but it will still be the same. You're, 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 you, in some instance, limit how much investments a utility can make per year in, a, in, in, in their service area. That's right. That's right. And I, I think that um, I don't, I, I'm, I'm racking my brain for an order in the last two and a half years where we've said something ex- explicit around that. Uh, but at least in the last five or six years, there have been orders where the commission said, look, we think you're making investments way too fast. We're worried about the cumulative impact on customers of those investments. And we would like to limit the amount of investment you make to X amount of, of dollars. Um, uh, the utility at any given time is uh, every time they file a rate case, they're certainly um, they have a right. in every one of those cases that to, to ask to say, look, we have a need for and I'm just making up numbers. The commission said you can only spend $10 million on this per year because we're worried that spending 15 or 20 might be too much. If the utility comes back in every single rate case, they can say, we want it to be 12 next year. We want it to be 20. Next, you know, we need it to be X because we have all these needs and not letting us do that results in Y. Um, the reality of rate making is that a utility can file an application to do something each and every single day after the utility, after the commission has denied it, right? There's nothing is ever permanent in terms of the commission's denial. The utility always has a right to come back and ask to do something different. So the utility, uh, just because I don't want to m- miss something, the utility makes profit on the more Senator they... Mr. Smith may have oh. a question. Yeah, just briefly. Um, so they, they so the utility can ask for a raise, but they can also apply for through increases also through different uh, federal agencies, right? Is that another appeal for them to go around <clears> and maybe <throat> ask for increased pass-through costs through like FERC or MISO or... Yeah. So it would depend on what the type of cost is. So... Um, at least well, I say with gas utilities, that may not necessarily be the case, at least not with the um, facilities that are jurisdictional to us. Uh, but with electric utilities, there are far more of their costs or their facilities that are um, in which federal agencies also have concurrent jurisdiction. Um, and the reality is that uh, we can't reprice a federal determination of rates. So if um, <clears throat> if a how do I say this? If a if FERC, for instance, says a transmission expense is X, uh, the their transmission rate is X, we can't that that utility incurs that cost, and there's nothing that we can do about that. The only thing we can do is not let them pass that cost on to customers. <laughs> a utility can only incur so many costs that don't get passed on to customers until there starts becoming a problem of them being able to run that utility. Um, if utility is incurring costs every single year and recovering none of it from customers, for instance, the extreme, uh, the utility is not going to be able to provide service. Thank you. I, I know it's much more of a complex no. question long term, but just for that purpose. Yeah, and I appreciate the question because I'm actually going to touch on that in the second half of, of the amount and increasing number of costs that are passed through to customers in which they were set in motion in, in such a way that we can't do anything about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kurt, Representative Kurt McCormick, did you have a question? Um, you know, I come from Martin County, and I represent the constituents there. And we've had a long, long problem with our water. Can you give me a brief status of what is going on with the water? I can. Can I do it at the very end of, of, of the presentation? You can. Okay. And, and a second question I have is, 
uh, our base base rate, this is without sewage, is now fifty dollars a month for base rate. How many how many gallon of water is permitted uh, or is covered under that base rate? I don't I don't have that in front of me. Like I said, we we've got one hundred and fifty water utilities. I, I don't. I, I don't remember the, the rates for, for the base rate, at least for Martin County. Or I guess I know about the rate, but I don't know <clears throat> every utility is different in the amount that you, I don't know, <clears throat> this is my characterization, that you get free with that base rate. Some utilities give 1,000 gallons, included some up to 4,000 gallons, and then some just have like a customer charge, and then you pay for every 1,000 gallon yes. over that. So I, I don't know the exact Can rate. Can you give me that rate. number because mm-hmm. uh, I have so many people – that are struggling with their utility bill, with their water. Um, <clears throat> our water's off half the time. It was off yesterday. Um, you know, it's just one break after another. Yep. And, uh, you know, I've hustled and, and lobbied for money down here for our water, and I know that we've gotten millions of dollars <clears throat> to put into our water system, and uh, we're still continuing to have large price increases, and we're still having to be without water for you yep. know, sometimes as much as 24 hours, sometimes as much as two and three days. So um, I, I wanted to bring that to your attention. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, and let's maybe we can limit those really <clears throat> very specific per utility questions to contact with you later or something. Yeah. This is this is all I do every day. So okay. please, you, you, any other questions, uh, any question, uh, I'll, I'll be here all day and then I'll, I'll, I'll be here for the next year and a half. So, um, so the, the, Assuming you make the exact same amount per dollar invested, right? The more you invest, the more money you make. So the PSC determines that cost of equity capital in each case. And then when doing, figuring out what investors need, it's not like debt where you've got a document that says what the lender requires uh, as the debt cost. Equity is is much more, uh, it's much harder to determine what investors are demanding to be paid on their investments. So in every case, the Public Service Commission figures out what that rate of return for equity investments are. Um, and we do that, and this is simplifying the, one of the most complicated things we do in half a sentence, but that we just figure out what your return ought to be commensurate with the risk that that investor is taking. <clears throat> so uh, that's the preface for securitization. So uh, the top line is the uh, a very legalese way of saying what securitization is. But the simplest way is in the first bullet, the second bullet point there, that securitization is a process that would be set out by statute so that customers of a utility can effectively buy an asset from the utility using money provided by bonds financed by lenders. So effectively, since the utility earns an equity investment or an equity return and a debt return on their own investments, replacing that investment with a only using only debt capital reduces the financing cost of that equity. So the best way to think about this is that <clears throat> you're not reducing the principal of the loan, but you're effectively refinancing it. And you're refinancing it, and it's not necessarily in the utility's name. It's certainly, I'll get to a second, it's not in the state's name. It is backed by captive ratepayers. So sometimes these bonds that are used to buy out the utility investments are referred to uh, at, colloquially as ratepayer-backed bonds because they're financed on the premise that a utility's customers, pursuant to a statute, have guaranteed the repayment of the bond according to predetermined rates and schedules. So here's a scenario, and I picked a fairly extreme scenario in the sense of the numbers um, make the decision obvious. Uh, but uh, regretfully, this is something that uh, plenty of states have dealt with, and, and at least to a certain degree, um, the folks in, in the eastern part of the state, will this will sound halfway familiar. So the scenario is a utility has a power plant that has $200 million left of investment on it that the utility has yet recovered. Recent federal environmental laws require that that generator, that power plant, either upgrade the power plant to come into compliance with a new law, or it retire by 2028. So the utility figures out, they ask uh, uh, you know, contractors and, and ask folks what it's going to cost, and they figure out they do RFPs. And they figure out that in order to comply with the law, that $200 million power plant is going to have to be incre- have to have investments made to it to get it in compliance, and that those investments are going to cost an extra $500 million. However, replacing, retiring and replacing that generator with another generator or 
group of generators would cost $175 million. And the assumption for this scenario is that the replacement generator would last exactly as long and be the cost of which would be recovered over the exact same life as what that new generator would run after it gets uh, reinvested. So the utility sits down, talks to their accountants and says, it is the least cost, most reasonable thing for customers to retire this current generator instead of investing an extra 500 million in it, and instead replace it with a generator that costs $175 million. So the utility comes to the Public Service Commission in that state and says, we want to build this new generator as the least cost, most reasonable option, given that we now have a need for generation since we need to retire this other old costly generator. At the same time, the utility requests PSC approval for the deferral and subsequent recovery of the remaining value of the retiring power plant as a, quote, regulatory asset. So you all, I'm sure you all heard Chairman Gooch say regulatory asset at the beginning of this. Uh, for anybody in here that pays a bill to Kentucky Power, uh, what used to be the Big Sandy Retirement Rider, which is now, the, I think, the Big Sandy Decommissioning Rider, is a regulatory asset. So a regulatory asset is a paper asset that reflects a cost that otherwise would have to have been incurred in a single year, like an ordinary expense. But it's treated like an asset, and instead it's recovered over a number of years. Generally, since it's a long-term investment and ties up capital, regulatory assets earns a return like other investments, including a return on the equity capital portion. <clears throat> so this extreme scenario, deferral accounting would make sense. And I'm not prejudging anything. I'm just saying the numbers are extreme. Without the ability to create that regulatory asset, accounting rules would require the utility in this scenario to expense that $200 million in the year that it retires. No one in their right mind that runs a utility is going to just step up and agree to take a $200 million hit if they don't have to in a given year. That $200 million is just imagine incurring a $200 million expense in a given year and see what phone calls you get from investors, right? From shareholders. So the retirement and replacement of the generator is an economically is economically better for customers because one of them is going to cost $500 million, The other one is going to cost $175 million. If the utility did not expect to get deferral accounting for that $200 million and instead knew they would have to eat that $200 million, they wouldn't do it. And that would be terrible for customers because they would keep running that $200 million plant and come to the Public Utilities Commission and propose the $500 million upgrade. So customers are going to be paying $500 million instead of the $175 for the alternative, plus a profit on that extra $325 million. So assuming that the PSC agrees that the replacement generator is the least cost best option to serve customers, here's where the scenario stands. The old power plant gets retired. The value of the old plant is $200 million. The new generator costs $175 million. And the utility earns a return and charges customers a return on that $375 million if it didn't retire and seek a reg asset. So here's where securitization comes in. Securitization provides an opportunity for customers to replace the $200 million of the utility's investment in that regulatory asset with $200 million financed by rate payer backed bonds. Customers pay, customers buy out that regulatory asset. So here's the benefit. This is where we get to uh, how, it, how it seeks. And I don't have slides on this part, but the benefit is that through securitization, which I'll explain the process here in a second, that $200 million that represents a regulatory asset, a paper asset, for, an, for a power plant that's now on the ground and retired, that if it's stuck with a utility under that uh, the, the, what I was talking about earlier, it would earn a 7% return for the utility each year. If customers, if securitization occurred, and customers through rate payer back bonds effectively were on the hook for that $200 million and sent a $200 million check to the utility, then the cost to customers, the financing costs would only be 4% if it was debt only. Therein lies the benefit that some states have determined is derived from securitization, that you effectively refinance regulatory assets for assets that are no longer in productive service. 
So the process, and I'm gonna move quickly here because you all have these slides, you can look back at it. But the process would be that the utility comes to the, and this is in other states that have this, um, a utility comes to the Public Utilities Commission and says, we wanna do securitization for this regulatory asset that we have. Um, we wanna go out and find bondholders who will lend the money to customers. And here are the costs and charges that we're gonna charge customers in order to make sure that the bondholders get repaid. And the utility isn't, those aren't the utilities dollars. The utility is just, they just so happen to have captive customers who pay bills. And so the utility be, will be recovering that cost on behalf of lenders. So the application would include uh, what the costs that are represented by the regulatory asset are. So a retired power plant that's now you know, on the ground is hopefully some, something else could be put there for goodness sakes. Uh, a testimony describing what the proposal would be uh, what the transaction would look like, what the customer impact would be, what the expected savings would be, what the cost of financing would be. What is that debt rate? Do you expect it to be 3%, 4%, 5%? And what, what is your proposal to ensure that those costs are non-bypassable so that customers have to pay them every month? Because that's why you get such a low cost of debt for these, for these charges. Um, I'll talk about it in a second, but securitization bonds up to this point uh, there have been $62 billion across the United States of securitization bonds issued by utilities. Almost every single one of those gets AAA uh, ratings on those bonds. And the reason is because bondholders feel very sure that they are going to be repaid their costs. And the reason for that is because of how strict the statutes are and how sure they are that those co that customers aren't going to get out of those co paying those costs. So the PSE would review and other states review the application to make sure that in totality, the proposal is good for customers. That would probably look like a net present value uh, benefit to customers over whether it's 10 or 20 years um, as compared to what would happen uh, but for the securitization. Make sure that the securitization doesn't unnecessarily impair the health of the utility. Um, there is a um, uh, some credit rating agencies are um, more reasonable than others. Uh, some perceive this to be debt for the utility, even though the utility doesn't hold the debt, some don't. Um, but certainly uh, that's something to take into account because you don't wanna make the utility so worse off that the customers are in totality worse off than they would be if they didn't securitize this. Uh, and then some states allow for the Public Utilities Commission, since this is what they don't, they don't do this every day, uh, to employ either financial or legal professionals. So uh, the PSC would look at whether it's a net benefit, uh, whether customers are going to pay the bond uh, until it's, it's fully paid off, um, and what the result of, uh, of the securitization would look like. So why do you securitize? Well, I've talked about most of it. You replace high-cost high uh, high utility investment with low-cost debt. Um, utilities make investment in assets in order to provide services. They're not financing entities, right? Uh, so this is a way to make sure that they get their money back so that they can then take that money once something is securitized and reinvest it into the assets that are needed to provide service. So a great example of this in most states that have used this for retired generators, the utility will take that money that was securitized after they get that check and they'll go and invest in the replacement generation. So about half the states have securitization legislation. Some are more broad than others. Some are very particular about what can and can't be securitized. Um, a couple of things, a couple of, of items that are allowed to be station. Uh, a couple of Midwest states who had, um, during winter storm URI, their utilities incurred billions, and I'm billions with a B, billions of dollars in gas costs over just a couple of days period, when otherwise they would have just incurred 